types, but when in writing down the Turing equation, I said, let's simplify and consider only for the single local, locus two allele, so we only had the plus minus unit type. But the security equation, of course, falls more generally uh, because you can always, if you, uh, you can always focus on one genotype and then everybody else, right? So if we distinct, do not distinguish between the genotypes of everybody else, then everybody else um, um, just acts as uh, one complementary uh, allele map. So, so we're going to stick to uh, considering the progeny of uh, this one individual, and we want to calculate what's the probability of having n uh, offspring alive t generations later. What we're going to do is uh, actually go to continuum time process. So it's going to be our branching. So here is uh, the birth event, and another birth event. So this is death, actually, I guess I should say. And so it goes. Um, uh, maybe this one goes on, goes on, and after some time, this turns. <coughs> so uh, let's uh, try to calculate the probability of having n offspring at time t plus delta t. Delta t is small. Time. So if delta t is small, with high probability. Actually, nothing has changed at all. Okay, and then there's a probability proportional to delta t that uh, one of the uh, n minus one uh, copies present in the population have given birth with a rate b. Uh, sorry, I guess I should have said okay. one over n minus one individuals gave birth with this rate. Um, okay, this is a t. And then we have to again subtract. This is the probability. Another possibility is uh, that one of n plus one individuals present at the earlier time. One of n plus one, one individual died. Right? So we went from n plus one individuals in the population to uh, uh, only n. And we're going to subtract, again to conserve. So this death rate we can just choose as a scale of time. So the death rate is going to be one. Uh, um, for a neutral allele, um, uh, the birth rate should be exactly equal to the death rate. So that on average, the population neither grows nor um, uh, shrinks. But more generally, we're going to include here differential fitness. Right? So, um, right, the difference of fitness of the genotype under observation and the mean fitness of the population. So I get annoyed carrying a tool at the location. So just define this as S. And uh, we will always want to assume that S is small compared to 1. That is, uh, um, um, fitness effects are relatively small and will be felt only over many generations. So we'll say S is much smaller than 1. So now all we have to do is uh, solve this. Uh, okay, before we solve this, I'm going to rewrite it until it looks a little bit uh, cleaner. Right? And that's plus S, N minus 1, P N minus 1. Correct. Plus S and 
equation, so it can be that part to solve, yeah. But don't we have to put the constraint that uh, big N, there is a maximum N? Yeah, thank you very much. Very good point. So, uh, in principle, yes. Uh, when we have the diffusion equation, then uh, we really uh, um, correctly treated both low frequency and the high frequency. Remember that the diffusion constant, for example, uh, vanished at zero frequency at frequency equal to one. And uh, this branching process uh, is going to describe only behavior at low frequency. Okay? Now it will turn out that uh, you can get a reasonably good insight uh, even when uh, the fraction of the population is, uh, is a one on one. But of course, what's happening is. Uh, uh, so, given it here, uh, um, what one basically has to worry about is uh, the behavior of uh, the fitness here, right? Since when the fraction of this particular allele rises in, uh, in the population to uh, basically frequency of order one, then uh, it will dominate the mean. Right? And therefore, differential fitness is going to decrease. Okay? So that was exactly so the saturation effect uh, that we, we heard about in the uh, seminar yesterday. Right? But uh, there is uh, a lot of interesting stuff that uh, we need to understand concerning newly born alleles. Right? When mutation occurs, it comes in in a single individual. So it's very low frequency. So it's particularly interesting to see what happens to them before they grow big and uh, take over the world. So, good point. Remind me. Okay. We got this equation to solve. Linear can't be that far. We're going to solve it using generating function approach. <coughs> So we define the generating function g of z by using p sub n as uh, the coefficients of its uh, Taylor series. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, well, as you see, the equation is linear, so all we have to do is uh, multiply this equation by c to the n, sum over n, rearrange the terms of it, and uh, you're going to find an equation for the generating function. As I should have said, this, of course, is a function of t, because p sub n is a function of t. And uh, that equation is going to have the form 1 minus z times 1 minus 1 plus s z dz dz. Okay? Not so bad. Uh, and you can immediately even understand why there is this uh, 1 minus z factorized because when z is equal to 1, right? probability has to be normalized. So the sum is equal to 1. So we know that g, z, ah, oh, z, and z equal to 1, is equal to 1. And 1 is time independent, so the time derivative of this has to be 0. And uh, we substitute z equal to 1. And uh, I got right inside vanishes because otherwise it would lose. Good. So we got another equation to solve. A progress that we made. But we know how to solve equations like that. When it's just a linear equation, so it's the partial potential equation with the uh, first of the derivatives. Them by characteristics. 
So the idea here is that uh, the solution is actually constant along some contour in Z T plane. And uh, all we have to do is find what uh, uh, the equation describing this contour is. So Z of T. So anyway, so this is constant for Z of Tau for tau, well, maybe I should call this one tau, and this is going to be tau equal to t, this is tau equal to zero. So we basically want to find uh, a contour like that, the locus of constant g, which leads us to the value z at the final point. And uh, then if we follow this contour to initial time, we will have connected z as a g at final time to g at the initial time. And we know what uh, this is. We know what the generating function is at uh, uh, time equal to zero, because at time equal to zero, there's only one individual with probability one. So we only got the first, excuse me, not the first, the second term in this sequence. The first term is n equal to zero, but we didn't start with zero, we started with one. Right? And that probability is one, so what we got here is z, well, curly z of zero. And that's what we need to calculate. And uh, then, of course, uh, before we can calculate it, we need to figure out the equation that, that this constant z satisfies. Uh, well, there's only so much teaching of method of characteristics that I'm going to do. I'm just going to write this uh, down and uh, record your head. That's what, uh, oops, I can't tell my z from the g. That's what uh, this piece satisfies, or just to say, uh, the right hand side is uh, equal to that, so minus z minus 1, 1 minus 1 plus s curly z. Okay, so now this is just uh, an ordinary differential equation. We solve it, we get an answer. So I'm going to write down x. So the answer has form 1 minus a of t, 1 minus z, 1 minus b of t of z, and uh, a of t is equal to s over 1 plus s minus e to the minus s t. d of t is equal to 1 minus e to the minus s of t. Uh, 1 minus, uh, what's the exponential? It's not so bad. Uh. Probability corresponds to n equal to zero. 
Right? So all we need to do is figure out the leading term in the Taylor series, Taylor series of this piece. And of course, this beast is said, is our generating function is exactly what we want. Well, z equal to 0, z equal to 0. So the extinction probability <coughs> is equal to p not 0. Is 2 of t is equal to g of 0 of t and is equal to 1 minus a <coughs> of t. What the hell? Yes, this one. 1 plus s minus t minus s t. So, in particular, <laughs> um, if S is positive and we look at long times, right, this exponential vanishes and uh, <coughs> then basically goes to 1 <coughs> minus S over 1 plus S. I can already say that uh, S is actually small. So the extinction probability is 1 minus S. But the extinction probability is 1 minus survival probability. So therefore, the survival probability is just proportional to um, um, uh, the differential fitness, provided that it's possible. On the other hand, so this is for uh, S bigger than zero. Right? On the other hand, uh, for negative S, for deleterious mutations, this exponential is large, right? And its survival probability, okay, 1 minus. Uh, Uh, the extinction probability is going to be exponentially small. Right? This is for, I have so much whiteboard space, but I got myself in the <laughs> corner here. Um, that plan. So this is basically saying that the uh, deleterious mutation is going to become extinct with probability 1. Uh, 1 over s generations after you can it. Right? So it will only live for 1 over s generations, but then if s is small, it will still kick, kick about for a little while. Okay? And finally, um, how about the neutral case? So when s equal to 0, I so have to be a little bit careful about taking this limit here. But, uh, but if you do it, you'll find 1 minus 1 over 1 plus t. Um, so again, at long times, the neutral allele becomes extinct with uh, probability 1. Um, OK, let's just start. But we can actually calculate a lot more. We can calculate uh, the whole probability of having exactly n copies. All I have to do is uh, type in seatbelts and uh, expand this money thing into Taylor series, combine the terms, and get the answer. And the answer has the following form. Maybe I should do it in the button. Uh, yeah. the so the answer will uh, uh, will have the following form. 
it will look like uh, <coughs> that. <laughs> and the T. And uh, I'll just give you some cases. So for <coughs> S equal to zero, for S equal to zero, this will behave as <coughs> one plus T e to the minus N or one plus T uh, one plus T. So this is S. That's the neutral case. Uh, so you may wonder why this crazy guy actually factorized the denominator like this. So the reason is uh, this factor gives you distribution of n conditioned on survival. Right? This is our survival probability. Now, conditioned on survival number of copies is exponentially distributed with the average increasing with t. So this is a peculiar statement. Basically means that if you look at the individual trajectories, on uh, average, you start at once and you start <coughs> this uh, walk and most of the trajectories will crash to zero. But the ones that are not extinct at time t are actually the ones that uh, have risen to rather large numbers. And they're still likely to crash. So basically, according to this, they will all eventually crash. The only problem is that uh, some of them will live for very long. Right? And this is uh, like the theorem about the all men going whole, but some die first. So uh, now we have to remember that our description here was only valid as long as uh, the number of individuals was much smaller than the population size. So there will be some probability that even the neutral reveal will rise to this large end. We expect it will take time of order m. And the probability of that happening, the probability of surviving up to time n, is going to be 1 over n. So basically, in a neutral population, there is a 1 over n chance that uh, an individual will fix it, will take over the population. And uh, everybody is, uh, is equal, so right, the probability is 1 over n. So it's all nice and consistent. And uh, you can go on. You can uh, look at S positive <coughs> and then find OI S squared minus e to the minus S T e to the minus S N S So what does that mean? Well, sometimes kind of that. So again, one factor of S out here is uh, our non-extinction probability, survival probability for now even beneficial allele. But uh, we know that the very small numbers, initially, even a beneficial allele can be wiped out by uh, drift, by stochastic effects. Right? But uh, 
given that it survives it is distributed exponentially and the characteristic uh, uh, um, uh, n or if you like average n is uh, in fact growing exponentially with time right? because the prefactor here is uh, uh, getting small so uh, you can convince yourself that uh, average n actually is e to the s t is growing exponentially as you would naively expect from uh, solving just deterministic equations right? that have uh, exponential Uh, but actually, it is a little bit larger than that. Right? It's divided by S. And uh, uh, that extra boost is uh, due to conditional uh, survival. Right? Again, just like in the neutral case, uh, those individuals that uh, survive uh, initially at low numbers are the ones that were lucky enough to rise to uh, uh, large numbers early. Right? So conditional on, uh, on survival, you, 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 you get uh, 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 so a large average. That's only if you're after it establishes, right? Yeah. Early times, that's not true. Uh, <clears throat> for a really short time period, a couple of generations. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so this, uh, yeah, so here I'm already giving us a topic result. Okay. Um, okay, so did I tell you everything that I wanted to tell you about, uh, about this? Um, Okay, I think maybe that's, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good point. Question. Okay. Uh, maybe I missed mean, something. That why not there are three for n equals zero? Excuse me. The the two sets of formulas that is the p sub zero t and p sub n t. They they shouldn't agree for n equals zero. Well, n equals zero is a special case. Okay. So and not this one. Okay. So that's why we have to do that. It's fun, you know, just to tell you tell you give you satisfaction. So um, well one can uh, actually learn all sorts of other using things. So for example, um, you can use this to uh, calculate the uh, real spectrum that you expect in uh, uh, in the population. So, um, for, so particularly in the neutral case, um, very often you, you, you imagine a situation that uh, you have a population with uh, um, uh, new alleles arising basically as a random Poisson pro process, and many of them having, uh, like most of them being neutral. And uh, uh, then you can ask, what's the number of copies of a given genotype that uh, you expect to find in the population uh, <clears throat> under the assumption that uh, um, all these uh, genotypes propagate neutrally? And uh, then really all you need to do is uh, look at this object and uh, um, just integrate over all possible times when the allele that you're observing came into the population. So you do this. So, sorry, I'm calculating the real features. I'm calculating neutral allele. Integrate, even minus n minus t minus t 
square. They wanted to do integrals like this in kindergarten. And uh, basically convince yourself that uh, this girl was just one of the hands. And uh, speaking with girls like uh, But let me turn this into frequency. So the frequency um, so n is equal to population size times the frequency, 1 minus population size times the frequency. So if we're looking at the, the spectrum, the probability of finding finite frequency nu, we can forget about this term. And all we're seeing in this regime is one over the frequency. So we're seeing lots of low frequency of them. This is actually a falsifiable state. Right? We did some mumbo jumbo uh, calculation here, but uh, one can go out there and uh, get data from, uh, uh, for example, HIV um, deep sequencing and ask how often does one see a given uh, genotype or given allele. And uh, it turns out to be not one over nu, but closer to one over nu squared. So this says that there are many low frequency alleles, but uh, um, uh, in reality, it turns out there are even more low frequency alleles than that. So, we arrive at the, at the point where we don't quite have the right theory, but at least this theory can be wrong. That's uh, so the next thing to uh, the next best thing to have the right theory, and when the theory that is falsifiable, we can at least be wrong. But, uh, it also tells us that it's not the, not, not the whole story, and uh, we have to move on. But uh, um, and of course, uh, you, 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 you suspect that uh, uh, actually what's wrong here is not so much uh, this analysis, but uh, the assumption of neutrality. So. Um, but uh, as it happens, much of uh, uh, the development of population genetics in the last 50 years has been dominated by the notion that uh, most of uh, the alleles that are out there in the population are neutral, and the humorous drift uh, therefore dominates uh, the dynamics. And uh, the few selected alleles uh, so rather rapidly come in and sweep through the population, and uh, uh, then you have to be very lucky to uh, catch uh, what we call the segregating allele. So an allele that uh, um, is only partially penetrant uh, in, uh, in, in the population, and, and so on. So I'm going to talk more uh, about it. But uh, for now, I actually want to tell you more about uh, the neutral theory, because uh, um, it has been the foundation of uh, uh, um, <coughs> genomic analysis for, for many years. So, uh, I have, I guess, 20 minutes. Okay, any more, any questions? Okay. So we were just looking at uh, the real dynamics forward in time. But it turns out that uh, it is very useful to look at this process backwards now. And that is called coalescence. Let's talk about neutral policy. Neutral policy. 
of our lesson. Otherwise, <coughs> so also now as humans for us. So human is a mathematician. Cambridge did uh, beautiful work, the statistician, I think it's probable, uh, some beautiful work on uh, some very uh, relevant population genetics. And so, why is this called cause? <coughs> process forward in time, now let's think about the process back in time. So we are talking about asexual population, so every individual has only single parent. So obviously every individual present to current time has a parent. So we can go back in time. But some of them, so either they have different parents, or they have some, some of them by chance have the same parent. So the number of ancestors decreases as you go back and back and back in time. And uh, in this particular case, if we track our population back in time, tracking it back in time, we come to what's called the most recent common ancestor. Most recent common Ancestor. And uh, understanding this uh, process is actually very important because uh, this is uh, telling us how related the individuals that exist in the current population, how related are they? Right? Depending on how far back in time. They call this, right? Um, they will be more or less related, right? So, if their uh, most recent common ancestor was very far back in time, then uh, there was uh, uh, time for a lot of mutations to come into uh, to the population, and uh, there would have been a lot of time for them to diverge. But if it was recent, then they, they will be very close, closely related genetically. But we really want to uh, make these words into a, a quantitative statement. So, let's try to calculate. Uh, what are we going to calculate? Let's try to calculate uh, the probability of a pair of samples in your population to coalesce in time t2. So it starts with pair coalesce. Pair coalesce. Right. So what we want to calculate is the probability of having no coalescent before time t2. So P probability of no quality before T2 generations back. But So this thing is, uh, we're thinking of a neutral population. So um, it's very democratic. So everybody is equal here. And uh, um, the probability of coalescence per generation is uh, just the probability that uh, the ancestor of uh, one individual also happens to be the ancestor of somebody else. And what's the probability of that? Right? The first one picks the ancestor, whatever it happens to be, and the second one has to pick the same out of population of n. 
So Boleson's probability is 1 over n. So the probability of male coalescence is 1 minus 1 over n. And uh, uh, we're looking for a situation where there is no coalescence for t2 minus 1 steps. Uh, and then, of course, the last step we want the coalescence. So that's one of them. Okay? We're interested in the situation when n is large. So t2 is also going to be typically large, much larger than 1. So we can approximate this by e to the minus, by an exponential, right? Minus t2 over n over n. Right? So this is basically, we just derived, um, the Poisson process <coughs> with uh, a characteristic time, um, so like with a rate of 1 over n. Okay? Now suppose what uh, uh, you're looking at uh, Wouldn't the probably no coalescence before T2? That would really be the sum of having a coalescence any time after T2. So aren't you calculating the probability of well, okay, coalescence at T2? Well, so make it uh, before, <laughs> not having it before T2, but having it. Probability of going from that. 
in time t sub k. All right. So this is the probability that uh, 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 there is no coalescence uh, involving the first pair. Um, this is the probability that there is uh, no coalescence. Okay. So the first uh, individual in the sample has chosen its ancestor. When the second one, when the second sample chooses, in order not to coalesce, it has to pick from the remaining individuals, right? N minus one over N. The next time it happens, the choice is between N minus two. And so it goes. Up to 1 minus k minus 1 over n. And uh, so we got the product here 1 minus j over n, where j goes from 1 to k minus 1. So, number of samples is finite, the population is very large. So we can just pull out the leading term in this. It's going to be 1 minus the sum of j, k minus 1, over <coughs> j over n. So we've got arithmetic series here. So this is 1 minus k times k minus 1 over 2 n. Right? So really, we just calculate that, okay, so this is the probability of no coalescence, so 1 minus that, which is this term, is the rate of having a coalescent event among k samples, right? So, going back to what we want here, we have that for 1 minus uh, k, k minus 1, so to n uh, tk minus 1 and the rate of time. So uh, this is really k choose 2 over n and I got here uh, uh, K choose two, T K over N. So now our situation is the uh, fault. If we were to draw a uh, coalescent, uh, we can sort of think of this as an event-driven simulation. So, uh, 
for the first coalescence, starting with k samples, we pick um, a time from this uh, uh, Poisson distribution. Let's say this is time. And we plunk it down. So this is my T5 here, started with five samples. Now, we started with five, and now there are four. And uh, now I pick uh, time T4. Uh, with that planning, I'm going to run out of space there. Uh, and uh, then I choose at random a pair to coalesce. And I call this and so on and so forth. Right? So this is my okay, so this is uh, my T5, this is my T4, this is my T3, and eventually T2 is the last one. So I do a very, very bad job of doing this because uh, of course, the rate of coalescence increases quadratically with k. So coalescence starts clicking rather rapidly here, but at the top of the tree, it is relatively slow. And I ran out of space. This is actually somewhat important. So, what have we? Right. <coughs> right, we can now calculate the total height of the tree. The total height of the tree is going to be the time to this most recent common ancestor. So I'm going to <coughs> erase everything. Starting with, uh, let's say, n samples, of course, is equal to uh, the sum of these coalescent times. Okay? And we want the probability distribution. So we're going to construct a delta function <coughs> starting with k equal to n, and it will run to n minus. Uh,
this is generated. Right? And the generating functions are good because uh, uh, it's easy to integrate over the delta function here. And what we're going to have is uh, z times tk. And uh, uh, there'll be product over all k's from 2 to n. And then we'll have to integrate over tk's with the distribution function that we'll calculate. Right? So this is just an exponential. So that's an easy integral. And the integral is from 2 to n, 1 over 1 plus n z a to 2. Okay. So, now let's calculate the average time to the most recent common ancestor. <coughs> Excuse me? Yeah. What does it mean, like larger equal or is it equal? The, the, because you have larger and then equal? Yeah. 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 About the yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. I'm okay, using no, no, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> the physicist's notation for the average. Okay. So this is average over. Uh, Okay. Um, uh, so this object is basically a derivative of uh, a generating function with respect to z, evaluated at z equal to zero, and uh, um, I think I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, so I'll just give you an answer. setting z equal to z bound. 
Uh, and this is actually because uh, g of 0 is just a normalization. g of 0 is always equal to 1, so we can always divide this by g of 0. Fine. But now I think I'm top 3 here. So this is z log 1 plus n z k 2. And I got sum from k 2 to n. OK? And uh, now the rest of it is just differentiation. OK, so this was arithmetic. But, uh, but the important result here is that uh, the total height of the tree, on average, in fact, is only twice as long as uh, the average time of pair coalescence. Okay. Average time of pair coalescence is uh, the height of very particular tree, the tree for n equal to 2. So, contrary to uh, my picture here, half of the height of the tree is spent at the very top. And why is this important? The reason this is important is, uh, now let's think about mutation. A mutation is a random process, and uh, it occurs in every individual at the fixed rate. So, once you have this tree, you can just uh, drop mutations here at random. Uh, you know, one is actually very bad at uh, drawing uh, random things. Mine is very regular here. Uh, and so this is, uh, say, mutation A, this is B, C, D, E, F, G. And uh, you end up with uh, some genotypes here that have in B mutation, in D mutation, and these end up in my picture having actually the same haplotype is alike. So they are genetically identical. So assuming that uh, nothing else is happening, right? And uh, uh, so this fellow has C. And uh, that one has C, B, and E, and this one is G and F. And uh, we can start asking all sorts of interesting questions. <coughs> For example, um, okay, so maybe I should uh, um, draw this. So. The n average is 2n one minus one. Let's say at uh, a rate mu, and uh, it's a Poisson process. So, uh, in uh, okay. mu, let's say is mutation rate per genome generation. Right? So the number of mutations in uh, um, in the whole population, rather, rather in the whole sample, which is going to be on average, the total length of the tree <coughs> times mutation rate. <coughs> so we can calculate the total um, number of uh, uh, mutations. Well, I'm going to use jargon. Segregating sites. 
segregating loci. So basically, uh, uh, the number of uh, mutations, so assuming, and it's not entirely unreasonable to assume, that the genome is very long, mutation rate is not so high. So two mutations hitting the same site is like being hit uh, twice by lightning. It's not very likely. So one can assume that uh, all of these mutations will hit different sites, and uh, then we can identify them and count them. Uh, so, so we have mutation rate times, now we need to calculate average total length, or I should say the length of time, total time in the tree. So the total time in the tree <coughs> is uh, the time to call S times the number of uh, ancestors alive at that time. <coughs> Tk, k from 2 to n, and we're supposed to average this. So that's mu n a, and this is 2, and we need over k k minus 1, and n there, to n. So k cancels. I got 2 n mu here, and the sum of uh, basically harmonic C from k equal to 2 to n. So approximately, this is log n. So we just derived that the total number of segregating sites in the sample increases logarithmically with the size of the sample. That's quite an unfair result. 2 and mu log n. And uh, this conventional to define uh, mutation rate, so the scale of mutation rate, and the relevant uh, um, um, time scale in this process, like in the mutual process, is uh, population. So that's definition. And we'll see in the papers that you will read, there will be a uh, theta, will, uh, uh, more certainly, yeah, that's the definition of theta. Okay. There are other interesting things. We can uh, ask. Uh, what is the average genetic distance between pairs? <coughs> right? So now our question is, pick a pair, any pair of uh, uh, samples and ask, how many places are they different? Well, um, um, let's pick, for example, this pair. So they, they share some mutations. Those are mutations that, that appear already in their common ancestor. But they're different than all the mutations that occurred since they come okay. So the number of differences between these two genomes is just going to be mutation rate times twice the time to call us for these two. So mu times twice average pair coalescence time. Um, so the average pair coalescence time is just n, right? It's half of uh, the total height of the tree, which was 2n. So we got 2 mu n, which we define as a theta. Okay. And 
again, this is interesting. What we got are two different ways of measuring the mutation rate. We can take the sample and count how many uh, mutant uh, alleles there are. Or we can take the pairwise differences. We can uh, um, compare pairs and average of all pairs. And that will also give us an estimate of uh, mutation. So this definition, so if you use this equation to define theta, it is called um, water estimator of mutation rate. And this one is called Ajima. Ajima's estimator. And uh, um, in principle, these two should be equal to each other. Um, so, but you can imagine that, uh, that in reality, perhaps the tree is, uh, is not neutral. Like the population may have uh, may be strongly affected by selection. So one can use uh, the comparison of the two estimates as uh, the performance sensor of deviations of, uh, uh, from neutrality. So one can look at uh, the difference between our two, right? we have a very clear sort of functional definition of, uh, of this number. And uh, then, of course, we have to normalize this difference to something intelligent. And, and of course, uh, intelligent normalization of this is to calculate the, uh, um, right? So these are averages. But we can also calculate variances. Take a little bit more doing. We can calculate variances, and in particular, we can calculate the expected uh, root mean square deviation for this difference. And that's what we want to use uh, uh, normalization. But I'm not going to write it up. So this is called <coughs> Kajima D. And uh, uh, I'm uh, going for this because uh, one of the reading assignments will. Uh, We'll be talking about this as you know, because uh, um, it turns out that uh, mitochondria will less that uh, in our paper you will learn why this is actually a good organism to study. Uh, and they're phylogenetic tree that is very different from, from neutral. And in fact, it looks much more starchy. And uh, so basically, if this tree looks like there was some major big bang a long time in the past, uh, and then each branch has been accumulating mutations independently, uh, I really should stop. So I'm not going to um, uh, go through this. But uh, you can convince yourself that uh, right. and the way you convince yourself is uh, just imagine this geometry and go through exactly the same kind of an argument uh, that I did here. Sprinkle mutations at random and uh, then uh, calculate the total length, right? Just the height times the number, and then calculate uh, uh, the average length in these pairs. And uh, then, of course, there will be very strong correlations between mutations that contribute to different pairs. Right? Because each leg contributes to n minus 1 pairs. Good homework exercise. So you will find that in this case, you expect the staging of E to be negative. Right? Mr. Boom. I'm sorry, I got the backwards. Uh, T minus double. So if you get the backwards, then 
You're doing it from different sides. So uh, you will uh, uh, find it. Okay. So, just... yeah, so here uh, we don't see that the mutations are neutral or beneficial or not. Absolutely. So here we're just, uh, what was happening here is uh, uh, we have assumed that uh, the topology of the tree, so the statistical structure of the tree, is neutral. We derive this tree by assuming complete equality of all uh, possible answers. And then we just sprinkle mutations at random. Well, no, most mutations I actually uh, use. So, uh, so this counting is uh, is not so bad, right? Just, but uh, uh, selection actually strongly distorts the shape of the tree. And uh, the hardest. Okay, I'll take you. Know, you don't have to worry about time. It's okay. Well, you have to do five. Oh, you do. Have any ideas? <laughs> I'm going to be second ring here. Right now. I'm going to be strong. Uh, okay, fine. I'll uh, I'll just do another five minutes. Because uh, the truth is that when I was originally planning a talk, I was planning mostly to talk about the. Uh, Stuff for the next five minutes. So, um, well, anyway, one can actually have a lot of fun with the uh, um, with the structure, and uh, there are other interesting uh, uh, things that one can calculate. One can uh, calculate, for example, the statistics of uh, uh, the number of haplotypes. Uh, uh, last known is modeling with satisfaction, and that's uh, the famous Ewan's uh, formula. Uh, um, so one can one can have fun with it. But uh, I want to take this into a little bit different direction, and uh, without actually going into any detail, uh, um, that describe what happens uh, in the trees. Uh, that are affected by, 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 by selection. What one sees is something more, uh, more like that. different from, uh, from that tree, aside from uh, me uh, uh, <laughs> going a little bit differently. Well, so the difference is that, uh, so we were actually calculated the rate of uh, coalescence here. And the rate of coalescence is basically for all. Things start coalescing right away and, and keep coalescing. So this is the... Uh, uh, P of T. So this is neutral. But sometimes, in fact, very often one sees the trees where nothing coalesces for a rather long time. And then everything coalesces to rather rapidly. And uh, um, when coalescence starts, uh, on the time scale of that whole tree, it almost looks like there are multiple coalescences at the same time. So, uh, uh, right. So, whereas uh, in this tree, and you can't see it because I didn't draw it right. Half of the height <coughs> is at the very top. In this tree, most of the height 
is at the bottom. Right? And uh, so this tree is actually closer to this extreme star topology, which uh, will be picked up by uh, the negative comparison of uh, the two estimates. And there is another interesting property that uh, if you look at uh, ancestor at some intermediate time, well, you can count how many offspring that ancestor had. And uh, so, for example, uh, um, uh, if we look, right, we'll look at this time, right, there'll be one, two, three, four ancestors, and you can ask, what's the distribution of uh, the number of offspring that they all have? So, in neutral coalescence, you will find, again, so complete uh, uh, democracy among them. So the distribution of weights is completely flat, subject to the constraint that all the weights sum up to the population size. Right? But otherwise, it's completely flat. So they're basically uniformly distrib distributed on the simplex. Not so here. Uh, in this tree, one finds uh, that there are some branches that have many more offspring than, uh, or I should say, some ancestors <coughs> have very have more offspring than some others. And perhaps it's not so surprising because this is under selection, so the thinner ones will uh, uh, have more uh, offspring. So. There's an interesting connection with uh, uh, spin glasses here that was uh, um, uh, very beautifully identified by Derrida uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, um, I think Pomey. Um, so, yeah. so they basically pointed out that uh, if one looks at average uh, so ratios of coalescent times, okay, we essentially calculated these numbers, so uh, they take some values in uh, Kingman's coalescent. So, for example, T4 over T2 is uh, 3 halves. So this is for Mr. Kuhlman. Uh, but in certain models of selection that uh, uh, these guys have uh, considered, one finds different ratios. Five fourths and 25 18 and so on. And these ratios are actually universal numbers. And it turns out that uh, uh, these numbers actually correspond to something known as uh, Maltzhausen, Maltzhausen Schnittmann coalescent. And that's it, they're rather interesting and simple coalescent process, it's, it's really very similar to a human coalescent, except it's more general, uh, in the sense that one allows multiple things to coalesce at the same time. So, uh, for this, uh, <coughs> VS, the interest of radiation, uh, so I should really say DSC, DS coalescence. Uh, the probability of coalescence, that's the probability of, uh, of uh, K modes to coalesce at the same time is equal to. Uh, 
probability of uh, two nodes to coalesce at the same time over k minus one. Right? So you basically, so this is the process where many nodes can coalesce at, at, at the same time. And uh, it has very different statistical properties from this object, but it seems to have very similar statistical properties, uh, statistical properties to the trees that are actually observed in, uh, in nature. And uh, um, there is another active, uh, um, so this is a very active and exciting subject at the moment. So we're actually beginning to understand, uh, again, in a rather general model of selection, um, what the structure of this tree is uh, in the presence of natural selection. Okay, thank you.